Hello. Um, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our today's lecture. Um, so actually, let's check the chat. Do you hear me okay? Hi, Yuris. How are you, Yuris? Uh, do you hear me okay? Okay, Sergey is hearing me. Everyone seems to be hearing me. Okay, so our today's lecture uh, is going to be a continuation of the functions lecture. Does anyone have any questions about um, yesterday's, not, not yesterday's, the previous uh, lecture from last week? Does anyone have any uh, questions about what we discussed? And also, is there anyone here who is for the first time? I don't actually, I don't actually recall any new names here, but if there's anyone who is um, for the first time, then please tell me. And also, if you have questions about the previous lecture, then please tell me. And also, if you could switch your chat to uh, all panelists and attendees. Uh, also, I will actually give um, allow to talk to everyone who is like you will be muted, but I will do allow to talk to everyone just in case um, we want to have a voice discussion. It will be easier. I can't grant it to everyone. Okay. Can anyone remind me where did we stop? from the previous uh, lecture. Oh, here, I have a marker, finish. Okay, excellent. And no questions about last time. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, <clears throat> pattern matching and functions. Uh, so we finished with identity. So pattern matching actually also expands to a function one interface. Um, and my question to you is, like we, we discussed pattern matching, um, we discussed pattern matching uh, last time. So as if we, not last time, a few weeks ago. So if you remember maybe then I think this pattern match is equivalent to um, something like this. Um, So this pattern match without the X, uh, without the match is equivalent to this pattern match with the match. And it basically is, you could be thought of a bunch of if else statements, else if we would have the default clause, right? Uh, and the question is what is gonna happen if we do a ping pong high? Like if we do something that, um, if we do something, we, if we invoke a pattern match on something, yeah, okay, uh, on, on something that isn't covered in the pattern match. So one idea is that it's undefined index exception. Another idea is it wouldn't compile. It's true that in some cases it wouldn't compile or at least there will be a warning. Let's see if we can turn this into an app and see what these things do actually. So the answer is that there's gonna be an exception. Um, actually slips my mind what the name of the exception is, some sort of undefined match something exception. Uh, so let's try it. So we turn this into a match and we're going to be invoking this function ping pong that's high and it's going to be an exception which will say match error. Match error. It's the match error exception which we're getting. And I would agree with uh, Igor that sometimes we were getting a um, compilation warning, which we can turn into an error using some SVT flags for this. And we discussed this earlier. We actually discussed this with, um, um, 
discuss this. Here we probably discuss this. So we discuss this if it was a sealed trait. So or a sealed abstract class. I think in this case we're gonna be getting. In this case, are we getting? In any case, when they had the ADTs, when we had the ADTs, then for sure the pattern matching on the ADTs. Okay, so pattern matching on the sealed trait message will be uh, compiler will check if it's exhaustive or not because it's a sealed trait and the compiler knows because it's a sealed trait it can easily trace what are the possible implementations. In this case, this is not happening. So what if we wanted a type of function where we could also check when is the function defined? You know, this function ping pong is only defined on a single parameter ping. What if we wanted to do a check and then it turns out Scala has a built in uh, trait called partial function, which you can evoke both to apply on it, same as on a function, it extends a function here, but it also has an is defined. So here we can do, um, is it defined on, is defined at, which returns a Boolean. So our expectation is that this one is going to print true because it is defined on ping and this one will return false because it isn't defined on high. So we can test this um, assumption and indeed it returns true for this line because it is defined on ping and returns false for high because it isn't defined on this one. Um, okay. So, um, and then if um, the expected type is a partial function, then the um, pattern which will be expanded to a partial function. So this is a equivalent of, uh, of this pattern match as a partial function. So then I have the following question. Um, let's see, what is the actual question? So here we're defining a partial function which works on lists. And this is a place for a, little, for a head and this is a place for the holder for a, a tail. And here the question is, will result one Will it be true or will it be false? You know, if we do, are we gonna get printed true or false? Can you write your thoughts in the chat? And also, if you have questions up to this point about partial functions, uh, then please write in chat or, or you can unmute yourself and Okay, so everyone thinks it's gonna be true. And to me, it makes a lot of sense. I think it will be true because we're invoking it on a clause, like it's not a single element list, it's a multi-element list. So let's see if the actual uh, compiler agrees. And yes, the compiler agrees, it's true. Um, and then we have this. partial function again. And the question is, what is result two going to be? If you can figure it out, how is this going to work? So Igor thinks it's false. I actually think it's going to be an exception. Oh no, actually it's false, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, not an exception. If we would invoke it, it's going to be an exception. Um, let's see. 
I think it's false. Yes, the is defined is false. It's a bit confusing that also this is uh, false. Like you can change it, it doesn't matter. So yeah, so it's false. Uh, I agree with you that it's false and let's see what happens. And it's true. Hmm. So that's interesting. Why did that happen? It's actually an interesting uh, question. Hmm. So, it is nil, but tail is nil as well. So let's see, if we add this clause, it's not even executed, which is really interesting. Didn't even get the ASDF here. That's fascinating. Hmm. Um, okay, we replace this with real methods. Um, is getting even more interesting. So it's never actually, wow. So, um, hmm. yeah, we don't do the actual pattern match, right? If we were doing the actual pattern match, on the list, then we would get to execute this one. Then we will like, execute the ASDF section. No, we won't. Oh, the I'm call, invoking the wrong method here, sorry. So yeah, so we if we are doing the actual pattern match and we are doing this, I think what is happening here actually is that the way it figures out, and I'm guessing here, uh, that we are covering, that it's defined on all the cases. I wonder how it's actually doing that. Uh, is that we have covered both the nil and the cons cases. So basically, this one is the cons case and that one is the nil case. And um, it figures out that both of the cases are covered. That's why it's actually is defined true. Interesting case. Um, if the list contains just one element, I think it will also be true actually. No, then it's a false. Right. So it needs two elements. Okay, so this one, so it manages, yes, the tail can be emptied. Exactly, exactly as you said. So it matches the shape 
this is false, this is true, and the tail can be empty, and therefore it thinks that this case is actually covered. I think the lesson is that was is defined, you have to careful uh, carefully think about uh, what your pattern match statements actually cover, and the other thing is it's probably usually uh, a good practice to think things through about all the cases you have to cover for your list so that you cover all of them. Um, I don't know, do you want to discuss this a little bit convoluted example further? I would suggest that we actually move on. I think we have more, more examples. Um, right. So here is an example of currying. Uh, so we have a way how we can define multiple parameter lists. So this is syntactic sugar for functions returning functions. So here, if we invoke translate M on a message, then we return a function which is a curry function. So we only, so let's see. So the type of, um, of A, uh, here is the message. The type of A is going to be language to string to string. Um, actually, let's take B. Type of A is translate M do this. That's actually wrong. I think the type of translate in a way is how should I express it? It's language string string. So that's the type of translate M. It's a function which takes a string. It's right associative. So it takes a string, it returns a function which takes a string and returns a function from language to string. Uh, so if we invoke it twice, then it's going to be a function from language to string. And then if we invoke it multiple times, and it's sometimes useful, but mostly you just want to um, want to uh, understand these method signatures if you see them. You don't necessarily have to write them yourselves, although there's some places you will want to. Um, so if we invoke the chain of functions three times, then we actually get the result, which is the language. If we invoke it two times, then we get a function from language to string. For this curry, it's called currying. If we have multiple parameter lists, it's the language term is called currying. And the name actually comes from Haskell Curry, which was an important uh, computer scientist who uh, came up with a lot of functional programming research. The other uh, in relevant name that comes from Haskell Curry uh, is the language Haskell. Um, so that's what the multiple parameter lists means and that's what it means when you say currying, a curried function translate. Does it make sense? If it doesn't, it's not super important. The main thing that you have to note is that you can write a function with multiple parameter lists. I suggest we move on unless you write some uh, questions in chat. Okay. Um, yes, it is a somewhat weird way how to write a method signature and it's kind of a syntactic sugar. 
Exactly, Yuris. It's a, it's a syntactic sugar for a function that returns other functions. Uh, and it, it's sometimes useful, you know, especially in a, in a way, like to be honest, this isn't what you would usually write in, uh, in my opinion. Usually you would say trans, like you would maybe say something like message string from language to language. Maybe you could write something like this. And then you have a Val English to Latvian translator. And that would be this thing. Um, hold on. You flip the parents around. Yeah, so it does make sense actually. Sorry, it does make sense. Um, translate M. Uh, so basically, this is how you trade an English to Latvian translator. If you wanted to pass around, you, you trade it and you pass it around afterwards. And uh, here you create the Latvian to English translator. And so forth. So it, it's it's kind of useful because then you pass it around as string to string function. It sort of, in a way, becomes the factory pattern with an object oriented programming. You would write all these classes in a factory pattern. Here, you just use this curry function to create your factories. Um, okay. So here we have two special functions which allow us to compose functions. So kind of use functions as building blocks to create uh, other functions by combining them in different ways. So here we have a compose. So add string compose double. Uh, so this will be the same thing as I'm guessing here, add string, compose, x. What are we doing wrong? Hold on. Did we already have, hmm. we have a language. Hold on. Did something wrong again. So this is int to language. Um, oh no, this is, uh, sorry, this is double. Yes, so this is the one. So this will be the same thing really. Um, So result four and result five is the same thing. We can check it. This should be returning the same result. Let's check it that it returns the same result. Right. So what happened here? Um, First, we invoke double on x. We pass the x of 14, we invoke double, and then we pass the resulting value to add string, which prepended new value. Uh, yes, yeah, so compose exactly use. Compose is another way how to string function calls into one. So add string compose double. And I think we can do it without the dots, make it maybe nicer and clearer. Can we? Yes, we can. Um, this is one way. 
And then the other way is flipped around. It's um, and then, which is kind of composed in reverse. This is again the same thing. I'm gonna return the same result. So these are all, this is all the same way how to write a consecutive invocation of two functions on a parameter. And Yuris, if you're saying that and then feels more natural, I agree in this case, it kind of seems more readable, double and then add string, uh, according to the order of operations, exactly as you say, Yuris. But, um, you know, maybe in some other cases, this will feel more, uh, more natural for you. So we have two exercises here. Instead of using the built-in compose, we are asking you to write the implementations of these two compose and then methods. And also, if you have any questions up to this point, then please write. Um, so we, you, you should be implementing these two selected methods right now. If you are completely stuck, then please write in the chat and we'll figure out something. Okay, we have a solution from Yuris. I'll try to write how I see it. So, and then is then have an X, A. Kind of my understanding how it should work. Do we have tests for this? So let's see, did I implement the same thing that you just implemented? Is anyone still solving the task? Do you need more time or have you kind of accepted same solution? So Igor's has the same solution. Does anyone need more time still or have any questions about why we have this as a solution? Okay. I actually think Haskell has shorter names for this, but Haskell has um, compose as a dollar and, and then as a daughter, maybe vice versa, probably like this. 
uh, so it, it can lend to very, uh, very nice, uh, um, easy composition of functions. Okay, any questions up to this point or can we move on to pure functions? Right, okay. Can we explain implicit? It doesn't seem that far from currying. Well, the thing about implicits is that they are often, it's kind of like this. So we have a function, take some parameter. And it can also be play, planted, it can also have an implicit parameter, uh, like implicit param of also some type. And it would be good to have this type as something very specific like decoder, I don't know, decoder, because uh, we don't want ambiguity here. Uh, decoder, my list. Okay. Here, decoder, my list string. Um, and um, what happens when this function f is invoked is that the compiler so does two things. One thing you can invoke it with um, specific parameter. You sometimes want to do this. So you have like a parent value of string and you have implicit um, so what you can do is you can invoke passing it specifically and then there's no actual difference that whether it was implicit parameter or wasn't. But you can also skip it, in which case, well, in which case, in this case it should compile. It's kind of interesting, hold on. So if we don't have this implicit, are you invoking this F? No, yeah, okay. So let's see. Let's 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 see what the compiler compile uh, complains. Compiler will complain it doesn't have this implicit. So what's going on here? We didn't specify the implicit parameter. Yeah, yeah, Igor, I will I will get to that. I will get to that. So initially we don't have this implicit in scope, this implicit parameter in scope. We had an implicit par parameter in the implicit parameters list, but we have no such implicit in scope. And therefore the compiler is saying we could not find an implicit value for implicit param. Like we didn't specify the parameter and therefore the compiler is rightfully unhappy with us and saying, I don't know what to pass as this parameter. Now, this would always be the case if we didn't have this implicit keyword here. If we have this implicit keyword here, and if we have this, if we have this value uh, that will still not be enough because we still don't have this implicit, but if we mark this value as implicit at the site of the invocation, then the compiler suddenly will be super happy. It knows that when invoking this function f, which requires an implicit parameter with a type decoder my list string, it should look within its scope for a value with, which is implicit with the matching type. The types have to match. And then it can, um, it can supply this value. And also I think we have magical uh, IntelliJ um, where do we have this? We have an IntelliJ feature, show implicit hints. Yes. So it shows IntelliJ can figure out that 
um, it's passing the implicit value here as an implicit parameter for the function f because it found the simplicity value and it can place it. Now, if this was a different type, if this was my list of int, then suddenly it would be quite unhappy again. It would say, I can't find it. Something's wrong. This is not nice. What is the use case? Right, so most, um, it basically allows you to cut some boilerplate. Like if you would have a parameter of which you would always have, you know, some sort of a context parameter that you always want to pass to invocations of that uh, uh, function and you want to cut down on some boilerplate, then you can do that. Uh, then you mark these parameters as implicit. It's kind of easy to sometimes overuse it. For example, the futures API uh, or the um, futures API requires execution context. What, what is a usual uh, um, case is going to be for uh, JSON handling. So here uh, in the JSON section, we will have a bunch of these implicit decoders. So here we have a song decoder, for example. Uh, and as long as we have these decoders in uh, scope, we can just write song as JSON, and we don't have to specify implicit, uh, explicitly what decoders this song as JSON should use to decode um, something as JSON. It will just automatically figure it out as long as it has these uh, implicit values in scope, and it becomes quite readable and um, you know, basically it cuts down on a lot of boilerplate and makes your code more readable. But of course, if you have used this functionality, then you have this interesting situation where your code doesn't work and you're really trying to figure out, you know, what are the actual implicit parameters being passed. Uh, so with great power comes great responsibility. Did Yes, uh, implicits will be covered in future lectures. I forgot which one is it uh, feature. I think in, exactly in type class, uh, because the thing is, <laughs> there's this thing called context bounds. What do we have there? Do we have the context bounds? Right. So with this syntax where you pass a type parameter and then a colon and something, uh, this is a context bound syntax, which is syntactic sugar for having an implicit parameter like this. Uh, so to understand type classes and providing type class instances, you have to understand the implicit parameters. But this is for a future lecture. We will get there. Did I answer your question on um, implicits? Okay, I hope I did. Right. And thank you for asking um, because uh, this is actually an important topic. Okay, pure functions. So pure functions are mapping between two sets and um, we like pure functions. We like pure functions because they're easy to reason about. Uh, you can replace always a, an invocation of a pure function with some parameters with its return value and the code should work the same way. That's the definition of it being a pure function. Uh, and impure functions are uh, impure if they are actually partial functions, like they are not defined for all values of an input type, or they throw an exception, or they return a value that depends on something else that isn't their parameter. Uh, they work with some shared mutable state, uh, or perform other side effects like printing to console, um, and um, yeah, and also we are returning to the topic which we discussed in the initial uh, lecture, 
that null is bad. Null can cause null pointer exceptions at any time. Uh, and um, this is uh, dangerous. So here is a question, is plus a pure function? So Yuri Sudmos thinks that yes. Who else thinks? that plus is a pure function or it isn't? Any other opinions? Elena agrees, okay. So everyone seems to agree. Um, I think it really depends how integer overflow is uh, implemented. I think it's a pure function, but let's just check. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is not gonna crash as an exception. Therefore, it will be a pure function. Sorry, I'm actually still at this stage. Yes, yeah, so we see that uh, it is returning minus two Therefore, plus is indeed a pure function. It is defined for even these parameters of two max values. Uh, of course, it may not be returning something that you know, is semantically how you look at that. So you need to think about this, but at least it's not throwing an exception. Um, while divide, Is divide a pure function? So do you think divide is a pure function without knowing the implementation? Nope. So without knowing the implementation, you think it's not a pure function? What if I cheat? What if I do pretty decent divide and it's gonna be a pure function, right? Yeah, and then I'm cheating indeed. So it, it depends on the implementation in this case. Uh, you can't really tell it by the signature, like divide looks like a pure function according to the signature, but divide, you know, divide one is likely a pure function. Well, divide two, isn't the pure function. Signature is the same, the implementation matters. And yes, indeed, divide two isn't the pure function because it's gonna throw an exception and it's gonna be very sad. We don't like exceptions. Because exceptions actually Turns out it doesn't throw an exception, it returns infinity. And we would have to turn it into integer divide for this whole story to work. It's not super, I think now it's probably gonna, uh, yes. So it turns out that the integer division two is not a pure function and the double divide two was a pure function, it returned infinity without throwing an exception. Uh, throwing exceptions is, uh, as I recently saw it um, um, discussed, is that it's um, like a go-to statement, except your label to which you go to, your go-toing, and go-tos are harmful in themselves, uh, your go-to statement label is kind of hidden. You don't know who, if anyone, is going to actually catch you or like if there's actually going to be a label and where it's defined. So it's like an obfuscated go-to statement. That's exceptions. Mm, okay. Is map lookup a pure function? Why or why not?
Yeah, Yuri says it's missing mapping. So indeed, so if we do a map lookup, If we do this, it's going to be throwing an exception. And uh, that means it's not a pure function. No, actually, this is going to be throwing an exception. So we see no such exception, key not found B. So it's only defined on a, some subset of its parameter set. OK. Um, pure function should be total. Well, it's kind of like the reverse of the things we discussed before about impure functions. Um, if a function returns for all inputs the same value, is this a pure function? Yes, just because it's the same value doesn't mean that it's impure. But doesn't mean that it's useful, although sometimes maybe it is. Um, can be, okay. So benefits of pure functions. So it's fearless refactoring. You can replace a value by a function uh, when it was invoked with those parameters like you can return the function notification with particular parameters with its return value, and the code is gonna work the same way, and that's called referential transparency. Uh, your function types are well documenting, and uh, it's easier to test. Pure functions are lovely to test. You can easily get test coverage for, more easily for pure functions. You don't have to do a whole lot of uh, uh, fancy mocking and, and stubbing and whatnot. Um, and better parallel processing and compiler optimization opportunities. So here are a couple of tasks. We have um, impure functions and our tasks is to turn them into pure functions. So we start with parse date pure. So any ideas, whoops, how should we do this? How should we convert this? And what should be return type? No, I think the idea is that you can change the return type. Like, um, yes, Igor, I think changing it to option instant is a good idea. Oh, we shouldn't change the parameters. Any ideas how we can implement this? Igor has an excellent idea in my opinion. I like this idea, I think it's gonna work. So this is how we implement this. Okay. Then we have the good old divide. Again, how do we do this? So option end. Is something like this. Yeah. 
we can also do, I agree with Igor, we could possibly, like if, if our requirements allowed this, we could do even this and say, uh, do also this, that's also an option. Well, it's not an option, that thing is option but it's also acceptable. But um, since this was likely to be meant integer division, then this isn't the same thing anymore. Like the semantics are a lot different here. So anyway, Anyway, uh, so here we have some loopy thing. So what do you think about this one? So this one has, it returns the current counter and increments the counter. Good evening, Ruslan. So, how could we do this? Any ideas? I have an idea. Are you coding this or do you, are you stuck? If you're stuck, then please write. If enough people are stuck, then let's just solve it together. But if you're actually doing this, then let's wait. Maybe somebody will solve it. So Igor is stuck, but he has a good suggestion. We need to pass the previous index. Let's do that actually. Um, so this was count, we passed the count. And well, it seems kind of weird, but. And then we can invoke it like um, something like, So something like this. So we get the, the Q was already defined. Um, so we get that this is the index being returned. What's the int here is, but we're always also returning the current counter position. It seems like a very trivial and convoluted example, but the idea I hope is sane. This is how also like purely functional random number generators are usually implemented. What about this one? Is after now? How do we do this? Uh, if comparing with instant now, but that makes it impure because instant now is not a pure function. It, uh, it reads some global state like the, current system timer, 
What could we do instead? Yeah. Yeah, so Yodis has actually a very good suggestion. This is a very reasonable suggestion. So we're passing the current date. And, you know, this would be kind of an example where I think sometimes if you would have to do it really a lot, Um, let's not get into that. I mean, okay, okay. Yeah, so this is a good suggestion. I mean, I was gonna say if you were gonna do it really a lot, then what you could define, you could define something like type uh, uh, now provider, which is providing the current time. And then you have is after now to date sent. Uh, implicit uh, provider. So we could do something like this. And then, as long as we have a production null provider, And we can check, is this actually gonna work? But I have to comment out where, uh, we'll see where it falls actually. Right, so it did actually execute this contraction where we had the now provider and of course in tests we can use something else and say um, I'm not saying the naming is excellent So in tests, you can actually invoke it with some specific fake now provider, which will always return whatever you give it so that you can write your tests easier. While your production code is possibly cleaner because you're just passing one parameter instead of two. Uh, okay, any questions on this? Okay, we have, uh, I think, last task for today. And we'll do a, a quick clash. I think we have time to do a quick clash. So last task is to, um, what does this do? All right, so we are doing a, a construction method which converts a list into a non-empty list. So non-empty list always has a head and then it can have the rest, which will be regular list. Um, and um, 
this should construct, convert the list into a non-empty list. Any ideas how we can implement this as a pure function? And of course, the problem is that um, problem is right now that if we just do this, we pass an empty list in it, then this is gonna this is gonna print something and throw an exception. And if we just get rid of the if, it's still gonna print and it's still gonna throw an exception because head on an empty list is gonna fail, right? So what can we do? Well, we cannot guarantee a non-empty list. Only the case class nil can guarantee a non-empty list. Um, we cannot guarantee that this list parameter is going to be non-empty. Uh, but we have the option, pun not intended, to also change the return type here. All right, Any, is anyone working or should we just solve it together? Okay, we have a suggestion from Yuri Sudnos. Not tested. So we change the return type to return an option here and then do this. So that's a suggestion number one. I actually have a different way how we could implement it. Slightly different way. Uh, any suggestions or should I write my idea? Oh, then we have more options. Yes, we can do something more. We can do, I don't think this is very clean, but we can do with a try like this. Either to save an error isn't very interesting because usually the caller is gonna know what the error is. Like if the only error that can reasonably happen is the list being empty, then the caller has the list and that's not super interesting. I think we should stick with option here. Any other ideas how we can implement this? Let's go. Oh, no, sorry. So this will also be the same thing, actually. We can discuss what is clear. And to me, I would write the third uh, implementation, usually, uh, because whenever somebody reads this list.head, it's a bit scary. You know, every time you are reviewing code here, you're thinking, hmm, He's invoking list head. Is the list actually always non-empty? And then you have to kind of understand the context of what's happening here. Yes. So if the head is empty, 
this head option is nil, then the mapping won't happen and we're just going to be returning, uh, sorry, if this head option is none, then we'll just be returning none. So all of these, they work the same way, except to me, this one is the most idiomatic in Scala. Sorry, this is pure speed. Okay. Okay, we will not be doing the final task because I think it will be taking more time than we have here. We'll probably start with it next time. Um, and my suggestion would be to do a clash. Who wants to do a clash? Anyone wants to do a clash? Okay, you already wants to do a clash. Let's do it. I will. I will do with the JavaScript guys having an option to code in JavaScript because why not? Let them show that they can write their JavaScript very quickly. And in the meantime, if you have any uh, actual comments, uh, then uh, please, like questions about today's lecture and also I'm posting a survey. So if you have time, please fill out the survey um, about today's lecture. That was the last link that I posted. And the clash is gonna start. So the plan for today is to do the clash review the results and, uh, and then call it a day.
And we're back. All right, uh, so we have two 100% solutions. Actually, a lot of them are still pending results. Uh, we have two successful solutions. Um, we have mine, which gets 0%. Uh, because I kind of uh, rushed and only retested on tests which were red instead of all of them. And the net result is I got uh, all the production tests actually like the test tests wrong. I think I'm guessing afterwards that a correct solution, uh, which I would write now, but I don't know if it's correct, is this one. But um, um, let, let's see what the actual people who have the 100% solutions, what do they have as solutions? So let's see. Uh, well, that was, um, that was interesting. Yes, yours, because it failed on the third test, right? It failed on the third test, which had doubles. But this one, I, I think possibly we have a case here where the tests which are given are not, um, are not actually representative of the tests which are then used later on and don't match the task description. So here we have kind of a similar solution, uh, except quite imperative where we're doing the sum here in the cycle, which is the imperative sum version. Like I like uh, just invoking sum on the list of numbers better. And um, here we actually have a solution with checks. It checks if checks if the remainder by one is a zero. It's also quite interesting. Oh, but it's a double. So, mm. I, I suppose what it's, it's doing conversion from double to int back here if it's a round number, but I think due to floating point arithmetics, I wouldn't actually trust that this, like uh, it would certainly, you need, you would certainly need some uh, real confidence that this is how floating point arithmetics works before you say that this is the correct solution. So we have George here who is, this is a more classical way in my opinion. Like here we have uh, the imperative way of summing where instead we can just invoke dot sum on a list of numbers. But here we're checking the remainder for them as integers. And if so, we're outputting them as float. And if not, then we're outputting the division as an integer. That seems to make sense. And that gets 100%. I-R-H-O, if you could share code, we could review it. And then we have a bunch of other solutions, which for whatever reason are getting zero points. And this one looks like it makes sense, but I guess it's because of the formatting. Um, okay. And then we are trying, we, are, we have one which tries to output nothing, where in case I think nothing, yeah, okay. Mm. I, I would say that this wasn't the most successful clash, uh, but um, I think the lesson is that these clashes, they are really finicky about the output format and also in this case, I'm not sure that the tests were, that we were giving were representative of the final test. So I will actually say that, give feedback uh, because um, I think this wasn't, wasn't actually accurate. 
Okay, if you could, if you could first of all ask questions, if you have any questions uh, about anything, then please ask. Uh, also, please fill out the feedback form. And uh, also, once again, be advised, we're actually in the process of announcing, uh, we will soon announce a Scala bootcamp that will happen in quarter three, quarter four, uh, here in a similar format online, uh, which also maybe some of your friends or colleagues might be interested in. So if you have any questions, then please write, or you can unmute yourselves and we can, we can have a discussion. And if not, then, um, then thank you very much for attending and have an excellent evening. Thank you. Yes, we will probably have a, a, a new lecture next Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye.